we're going to have a look at some things about diversity and related to that some things about conservation. Now I'm lucky enough that I've got a pond at the bottom of my garden built perhaps about 15 years ago and gradually it's becoming more and more diverse. When I started I put a few plants in there and they actually haven't survived. None of those sort of have done really well. I put some goldfish in there and as time's gone on my five goldfish have become quite a lot. I have actually no idea how many I've got in there. There's, there's quite a lot. Uh, pondweed has grown. I've got lots of watercress growing in there. I live in Hertfordshire in England and it's the home of watercress and with our water flowing because it's got a little sort of waterfall in it feature I suppose it seems ideal for growing watercress which uh, almost grows in my pond like a weed and if I have a look in there and I take a sweet net I can have a look at the different numbers of creatures that can basically can't get out of the way of the sweet net. Uh, the fish do, the frogs do, but basically I can catch a whole load of different other types of organisms. There are some very good guides out on the web to give you some ideas of some of these. Here's one, this is done by Opal and it gives an idea of some of the sort of worm-like animals that I might find in my pond and I can certainly see some flatworms and yeah I've got some leeches in there. I do see the occasional dragonfly, caddisfly coming out so maybe they're damselflies, I do see these coming out occasionally and I've got to catch the right time for that to sort of happen. I don't see many snails in there and I don't really see too much in the way of things like water spiders but I know when I've taken samples that I've got lots of things like water fleas, water mites in my pond. But using a sweep net, I can't see these. What I do see, going a little less enthusiastic, are quite a few pond skaters on the water surface. And if we go down and have a look, then we can see possibly some of the other things in there. So I've got some ponds, skaters, and of course we've got some water slaters, these sort of wood louse type of things. So although some of those say that I've got a pond health score perhaps of one there, We've got quite a few other things which suggest I've got a, a health of five and I can look at some other things in here that tell me that I might occasionally go up and have a pond health of something a little bit better than that. Well, let's take the sweet net, let's go through and see what I've got. And here I've got some ideas of the creatures that I might have. Now let's make this area here a little bit bigger so you can see what we've got. And I've taken here a look at my sweet net 
and I managed to capture eight pond skaters, quite a few water slaters, one flatworm, seven leeches, all on a stone that I caught, and some midge larvae, depending on the type of year, if the time of year it is, which at the moment is sort of July. So if I add up, I can see that I've got a total of 37 creatures that I caught. So I want to look at the amount of biodiversity that I've got. And this we calculate with my D is going to be 1 minus here the sum of N over big N all squared, where we can say that big N is the total number of basically all the species and when I did that I managed to get 37 and then we've got little n which is the total number of basically each species and I've just told you what those numbers are so let's see if we can do some calculations to work out what the Simpson's Index of Diversity, which is what this is, is for my particular pond. Let's go over to the spreadsheet where we'll try and work this out. Now, for each of these organisms, what I need to do is I need to work out little n, this number, over this number, 37, and I want to square it. So in here I'm going to enter a formula which we're going to do by pressing the equal sign and then it's going to be this number divided by this number. Now that number is going to stay the same and this is why it's worth doing a spreadsheet. So I'm going to put this in as I didn't mean to hit the thing, I just want to put a dollar in front of each of these. And this sum, what I want to do is I want to put it in brackets and we're going to square it. So I'm going to do carrot 2. And that depressingly is going to give me zero which is not what I expected there we go a much more likely number that I expected and let's take that and replicate it down now what I want to do here is I want to sum up that so let's just do an auto sum and that gives me a number and then back here on the equation we can see it's going to be 1 minus that number so my index here is going to be what a formula which would be better let's just put in this as a formula equals one minus that cell and that gives me 0 0.72 which means that my pond has a relatively high diversity 
of creatures in there. How did all these creatures get here? Well, that's really probably due to birds coming along, other insects coming along, flying in. We've got the plants that I bought might have had some snails on them, they might have had some leeches, they might have had various things on them that I put in. So, some's come by air, some's come by other means. We have had occasional visitors to the pond, it's not a very big pond, but it has been popular with a few herons, or maybe just the same heron, uh, coming along and emptying my fish stocks. And it's been popular with the local cats who occasionally have managed to fall in and uh, scrabble out. We've got quite a lot of frogs and depending on the time of year we may have quite a lot of frog spawn. So depending on what time of year you look at your pond you can see we've got different amounts of biodiversity. And what I like about my pond is the amount of diverse life that I've got in there. Leeches may not be everybody's cup of tea, but it's nice to see that they're there and they're doing existing and providing perhaps food for various other things. My goldfish survive and the reason they're surviving and doing quite well is one, the heron doesn't seem to like eating them too much. and there are plenty of food for them to eat, whether they like one thing or another. So we've got here some diversity here, which is really useful. Now, what we also need to do is worry about trying to preserve some of these creatures. And if we look back at that list of organisms you can see that if your water is really healthy then you're going to get things like the dragonfly larvae living there, the caddisfly larvae living there, as well as other things depending on what they want they they need really quite clean water to live in and when I have a look at my water and my pond it is actually quite clear I've got another pond because I've got two and the other pond is not as clear and in that one I find far more in the way of water slaters. The other one has a few and I think they go from one pond to the other. But we don't get too much in the way of some things. For instance, I have, a bit keen there, have no water bugs that I've seen in there. I haven't seen any back swimmers or water boatmen. I haven't seen any water scorpion or water stick insects. And I haven't seen any water beetles. Now that could be just that they are not lucky enough to sort of arrive at my pond. Maybe I'm just not lucky enough to spot some of them. But if you want to try and keep these sort of creatures, then we don't really want a yucky pond, which is sort of with a health score of one. But what we want to do is if we want a fairly diverse environment, then we need to keep the pond fairly clear and yeah I've got quite a few 
one creature is, but I occasionally get some of the other ones as well. So that means that my pond is probably reasonably diverse, as it seems that it is. And we've got here some sort of conservation of some of these creatures. What we can also do is we can look at the genetic biodiversity of organisms. One of the things that we can do is to move on from the Simpsons index and instead we can have a look at this idea of maintaining the biodiversity. Basically, it enables the survival of different species. So, we can calculate here the genetic biodiversity. Now, how are we going to have a go at doing that? Well, within a species, individuals probably have very little variation in them. Yeah, all the species are going to contain basically the same genes. They're off of the same sort of family. So they're very likely to have the same types of genes and not be sort of very genetically biodiverse. If we start changing the environment over a long time, then they might slowly adapt to this new environment. Some are likely to become extinct and some are likely to try and change. But this is talking about doing this over a long period of time. And we're relying on here genetic mutation to try and affect this. We can get perhaps interbreeding of different populations and this we call gene flow. So we've got mutation which is just literally some sort of chemicals or I suppose we can have other factors like UV light sort of affecting basically the DNA. We can have interbreeding which is really quite a good idea. Interbreeding enables us to keep sort of genetic strength going on. We call it hybrid vigour and this sort of keeps the populations going. This interbreeding which we can call gene flow basically of transferring alleles from one population to another. Now in order for the genetic biodiversity to decrease, then the number of alleles in the population must also decrease. And that is happening when we get selective breeding. And this could be by artificial selection or it can be when just some few individuals in the population are selected because they've got genes that are advantageous. If I'm going to look at trying to improve biodiversity then I might want to look at what is around here. Now around Hemel Hempstead where I live near the Chilterns there used to be lots of red kites one reason or another they died out 
probably man. So they were reintroduced. A captive breeding program was done. Now this captive breeding program basically meant that we had some animals basically in a zoo or captured from other parts of the country or another country and these were bred and then we reintroduced these and I have to say that these red kites now are doing really well I see several every day and I know they're several not one because we see them sometimes at the same time so they are breeding we seem to see more of them around all the time so the red kites are now living back in their old habitat it was suited to them before and we see them over the town where they also probably find there's a fair bit of roadkill to go and go and eat which is their sort of favorite how about rare breeds we see more and more every day some rare breeds of this that and the other what are we going to try and do with these is it worth trying to sort of take these rare breeds and put them into captivity and try and help them breed and then perhaps put them back into the population and I suppose man can help here by doing some artificial cloning sometimes to try and help some of the particularly here plants get a better foothold if I find for instance a rare orchid there's only one around if I can take that and I can clone it then I might have a hundred and we can keep it going but the genetic diversity of course when we do that is much lower and that can give a particular problem uh, one of those problems might be related to something like a banana oh, they're very common yeah but if you look in a banana you realize there aren't any seeds so bananas don't breed they're all made by cloning and that means that if we find something that comes along and that destroys a banana it then has the potential to destroy all bananas and that is a bit of a problem so let's go th continue going through our list of what we can do to try and improve things well we've got as well as all these things the usual rule of natural selection we've got natural selection animals choose decide which genes which alleles are going to be the most advantageous and over time we see those rise to the surface related to this are genetic bottlenecks a genetic bottleneck is where a few individuals within a population survive an event or a change there's some disease the environment changes the habitat gets destroyed something like that and this will reduce the gene pool and that means that there are only so many of these alleles available for all the 
offspring to be received. We've also got the founder effect. And this is probably very true of my pond, where a small number of animals have created a new colony and they are geographically isolated from the original and they might change. So maybe my water slaters are different to all the others. Or maybe not. we can get some genetic drift. Here, due to the random nature of alleles being passed on from the parents to the offspring, basically the frequency of some allele are gonna, it's basically going to vary. And maybe this gene could disappear and this is where we generally have populations with particularly low genetic diversity. So, these factors here basically affect everything going on inside my pond and any sort of ecological niche we want to have a look at. We can measure a lot of this biodiversity using things like uh, gel electrophoresis of the DNA. We can start having a look at the DNA and have a look at what's going on and that is well suited to sort of working in a lab and doing that and that's basically outside the scope of what I can do in my home. So what factors then affect this biodiversity? Let's have a look at those. The obvious one starts to be humans and I look at my pond and I built my pond. So where I live there is no pond until I came and I decided that I wanted to have a little pond. And I dug a pond about to one and a half meters deep, one and a half, maybe two meters deep, trying to look at it, I can remember my little boy standing in it and it disappearing, so it was certainly over sort of a meter deep. And I built up from there, over the years, a pond that's gradually become more and more diverse. So here, I've actually done something to create a pond, to create a little oasis of life. And it attracts frogs, it attracts various other creatures and presents sort of an environment for them to live in. But over the years, my garden's changed and it represents a different sort of habitat for different creatures to live in. So, as well as sort of creating something, I've also destroyed things. I've taken away perhaps the weeds because I wanted my garden to look like something else. So, the first thing that we look at when we look at somewhere like England is that if we came to have a look at England, and I went up for a nice little walk with you some sort of 10, 15,000 years ago, we've got all this forest. And we're seeing here 
deforestation. England has changed from being a forest island into basically what we see today. We've got space for roads, we've got buildings and cities, we've got areas given over to agriculture. But fortunately, we've also got the hedgerows that will help. So, deforestation is going to cause that, but how about the process of putting in agriculture? Here, farmers are only going to grow basically a few species. And this is not going to help. These are only going to be certain crops or plants growing. They may just rear a few species of animals. So that's going to apply both to plants and animals here. And some farmers seem to get quite upset if they've got hedges where foxes and badgers are on the increase and they're competing with their livelihood and they want some of those other animals and plants removed. Deforestation has allowed agriculture and a lot of England is well known for its hedgerows. I saw today on my Twitter feed, my local area is saying that, my local authority, saying that what they're going to do is they're not going to cut the grass verges as much. They're trying to encourage lots of flowers to grow, the typical English meadow flowers and the sort of other types of flowers that we find that grow natively in the country and that by the side of the road which is land that's basically not used encourages all sorts of other wildlife it encourages more insects and we have to worry about some insects sort of dying off and disappearing we're looking at a bee problem that perhaps there's not enough food for the bees to sort of gather maybe diseases are affecting their population and we've got to try and do everything we can to try and keep them going so keeping things like hedgerows very important the removal of these hedgerows to help sort of large machinery certainly increases the yield of the crops that we want but it's decreasing the biodiversity and we've got with this the use of chemicals either to promote things growing or in the form of pesticides and herbicides and trying to tell an insect that you can only go in this place just doesn't work. So sometimes the better way of dealing with this is finding other insects that will eat other pests. Chemicals such as pesticides then can be a real problem for biodiversity and we've also got herbicides which will destroy all the local native plant life and that I don't think is really going to help too much. Many farms go for what I would term a monoculture 
they only grow one crop. It's well be suited to this one crop, but it is nevertheless just one crop, be it rice, potatoes, wheat. And this has an enormous local effect in reducing the biodiversity. The next major change, apart from humans, and I suppose really is still humans, really, is climate change. Climate change is happening. The evidence now is fairly overwhelming. Not necessarily for some people to see it, but it is happening. And we see all sorts of data trying to show that this is really happening. This climate change causing all sorts of problems in the world. And even I can manage to see this. What I've got on my house are some solar panels and I record every year how they're going, how much energy I'm recording and I get nice little graphs here of individual years or put them together for the average and we can see that different times of the year we get different amounts made and June we can see is always a grotty month and I can work out here which ones are doing really well, where we get record months and where we get poor months. But what I did do is I tried this graph of a moving average. And just recording the amount of sunshine going along, we can see on a, uh, this is how much I made each year. But if I take that blue line, but if I look at my red line, we're seeing that in fact this is moving up. So just on about 10 years, I can see that over a period of about 10 years, the amount of sunshine I'm getting is increasing. And that's just me taking a local look over the last 10 years. For proper climate change, we've got to look over a lot longer than just 10 years and I've only got some little bit of data just to show that that's happening over the past 10 years. But it does happen. It is happening. And it is something that we need to sort of worry about. We've got basically a warming trend over the last definitely 50 years and we can see that that has been much more than was over the previous 100 years. It was twice as much as over the previous 100 years. The average amount of water vapour in the atmosphere has increased and that happens because basically we've got warmer temperatures. So we have greater amount here of water vapour. Yeah. We're also seeing the temperature in the oceans increasing. The, there's something called a thermocline. And this is the levels of water and the temperatures at the different levels of water. And we're seeing this here increasing. The depths are increasing here 
for the temperature. So the ocean is basically absorbing a lot of the heat. This thermocline is getting bigger and we're looking at perhaps the oceans absorbing perhaps as much as 80% of all the heat that's been added. Now this has a problem because if the water's hotter even by a little bit it's going to expand and this is going to cause the sea level to change and we're seeing here the global sea level rising here a little bit. Of course if this water is generally warmer then we're also going to see the glaciers and the pack ice diminishing. So we can see all of these things on climate change and as this happens then we've got to start to make really important decisions because these important decisions are going to have far reaching effects on what life is going to look like on earth. If global warming continues then biodiversity will be affected. The melting of all this ice is going to cause the extinction of some plants and some animals. We're going to see that. We watch perhaps the news articles and we see that the polar bears are, are struggling more. You look at the Arctic and we see how it's shrinking over the years doesn't seem to be doing too much but it but it is Greenland's getting greener these rising sea levels are going to affect things we're going to get more salt water flowing further up the rivers and that's going to re reduce these habitats that we've got now that's not necessarily such a bad thing people say we've got to keep the things the same well maybe we don't have to keep them same because things do change and as we lose one habitat and someone moans and says yes we're losing all this habitat true but we are gaining a new one and that can allow biodiversity over a period of time to increase higher temperatures and less rainfall can cause other problems. We're seeing some need for drought resistant species. Some of them are becoming more dominant because the other ones basically aren't coping at all in this environment. Insect life cycles change and as that changes so we get in more and different animals that eat them. If climate change is slow then we can see animals, plants start to adapt. If it's fast then animals don't have the time to adapt and this causes a lot of problems. So why do we need to try and maintain biodiversity? I suppose let's just do that one to try and explain the why. Why do we need to maintain biodiversity? We hear this all the time that these animals are dying out. Why does it matter? So let's see if we can cover here a few of the reasons 
for maintaining biodiversity. Well, there's always the, the obvious one, I suppose, which is for aesthetic reasons. The presence of particular plants, we're used to do looking at them, seeing them, enriches our lives. So you sort of look at the local woodland and it's got these particular butterflies in them and you think that's really quite a nice reason for keeping things as they are. But I suppose there are some economic reasons for trying to keep things as they are. If we keep them as they are, then we are going to certainly reduce things like soil erosion. We're going to reduce the desertification. In other words, producing deserts because we are doing deforestation. It's important to conserve all organisms, basically, because we never know how things are going to change and what we may need. Because once all of that raw material is lost, it can't be sort of put back. Large-scale habitat and biodiversity losses mean that Basically, we're going to get different species. And different species could affect what's growing there at the moment. And that's going to affect our economic reasons. Let's think of other problems. If we've got this idea of continuous monoculture then the soil's going to run out we're going to get what I would term soil depletion we're going to run out of certain nutrients and minerals and these need to be replenished and that can really affect the ecosystem. High biodiversity gives us some protection against abiotic stresses. That's the extreme weather, the natural disasters, as well as the biotic stresses such as diseases. When the biodiversity is not maintained, a change in conditions can cause entire crops to fail. And this we can remember with something like the Irish potato famine. Which happened in the 1840s. People relied on just two varieties of potatoes. So a new disease came along. Neither of those species had any alleles for the genetic resistance to it. So all the potatoes died. There was a widespread famine. And a million people died as a result of this. Had they had a high variety, then some of those potatoes might have survived and then the problem would not have existed. So 
areas of rich biodiversity are really pretty they provide all the things like in this country the forests and the sort of parks and I'm not thinking here of a city park where it's sort of just sort of mowed grass but where we can actually have natural things growing plant varieties are needed for all sorts of cross-breeding which give things like disease resistance and that would have stopped this potato famine so we've had aesthetic reasons for doing things economic and I suppose there are profound ecological reasons. All organisms are independent of one another. And if you start removing one then you're going to start damaging the other plants rely on bees for pollination if the bees are dying out then the plants have a particular problem we've got certain species which are really important and these are called the keystone species. The keystone species have a disproportionately large effect on their environment because of their abundance. This is either in numbers, productivity or in fact biomass. And these keystone species, if they're removed, they can drastically change the habitat. And we see this, especially in places like rainforests that are being pulled down. But there are a lot more examples of some of these. There are the, the famous sea stars, predators, and as long as they're around then that's great the sea stars are creatures that eat mussels and sea urchins which have no other natural predators if you remove the sea star then the mussels have a population explosion and that cuts down the number of species that exist in you know the area so big problems with those so human activity against biodiversity so let's have that one human activity versus biodiversity this is the key bit to all of what we're trying to do Human activity has basically a negative effect on biodiversity. What we're trying to do is we're trying to make all types of things. Let me go deal with that one. Right. I'm reaching over trying to stop the uh, device irritating me. Humans have lots of problems on diversity, deforestation, clearing land, bringing in a monoculture. However, what we can do is we can bring in a whole load of new things by doing this. By being more intelligent, we can change the biodiversity. We have a road. Now, that's going to carve up the land that's going to reduce the biodiversity but if we plant hedgerows if we allow plants to grow in the verges then this
can increase the biodiversity. We can keep the number of animals living there, eating there, growing there, up. And that's going to attract other species in. So all of these sort of things affect biodiversity. We want to try and conserve what we've got. We don't want to do too much in the way of change. And if we can do that, we can keep our planet going. So that's given you perhaps an idea about why all of these things are important. Over the last few lessons, weeks for me, but you can watch them in one go, I've looked at a whole series of reasons why we need to keep and measure biodiversity. It's really important. It's probably the most important thing that we need to do on this planet today, and yet it often gets neglected. If you found some of this interesting and liked it, then please give us a thumbs up. If you do like it, then please subscribe. And I'll see you next time when we'll have a look at some more A-level biology, looking at it topic by topic. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.